Hello, ladies and gents, and welcome to yet another episode of the Nailed It Orthopedic Podcast, hosted by yours truly, Dr. Wendell Cole and Dr. Or. Jay Fitz. Oh, there we go. He hit it with the slam dunk and Dr. Jay Fitz. And uh, it is kind of our goal to talk about different orthopedic surgery topics and have people ready for their board exams and, you know, kind of just uh, just come up with some with some knowledge, guys. So if you're, this is, if you're listening to this for the first time, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Um, go ahead and, and uh, listen to some other episodes after this one. And uh, and uh, Dr. Fitz, man, how's how's uh, how's intern year going? Uh, I mean, you know, it's going pretty well, man. It's it's going pretty well. It's uh, it's it's all new. I think that's that's the big thing. Um, uh, but I'm liking it. It's, it's much better than med school. The only thing med school has close to it is fourth year, and that's just because I was doing away programs in ortho. So, um, how is the pimping? Man? Just, how is the pimping? That's the question we all want to know. Are you getting pimped a lot? Are you getting <laughs> pimped first? You had to be getting pimped. First of all, I don't like that term. Uh, <laughs> this whole pimping term, I, I, I never really understood it, even as a med student. I mean, they're trying to help, right? Uh, they're trying to help increase my my knowledge. So I, I appreciate put having the spotlight placed on me. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes it's like, I like sometimes how you like eloquently stated that. Uh, yeah, having a spotlight. You know, they just putting a little bit of the spotlight on there me. There we go. All. It's a great way to look at it. And I guess it all just depends on what you do with that spotlight, right? All right, but let me put it on you real quick. Biggest hurdle so far of intern year. What is it? Steep, steep learning curve, man. Just just figuring out all the little things, man. I would say it's the orders. Figuring out how to do how to work the system, put in orders. You know, you're not really doing that as a med student, but as a as a doctor, <laughs> you're putting in orders. You're writing prescriptions. You're transferring people from uh, different places. Uh, you're putting in bedside commodes and consults and, you know, all that stuff. So really, once you get the hang of that, then I think everything else comes with time, man. I agree. I agree. Uh, that was definitely pretty tough. But, I mean, honestly, what it took. It, it took two, three weeks after that. You know, you have a pretty good – you've pretty much done most things you're going to do with the system. Probably – I'm not going to call any system names, but we probably all know which – what most of us use for uh, – <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever. But uh, other uh, than that, I mean, just like you say, it's a steep learning curve just all the way around, uh, remembering every little protocol that you have or, you know, you got a spine patient and you find a, a fracture – and the thoracic spine, uh, but there's no imaging of the lumbar spine. Uh, you need to go ahead and get imaging of the full spine. Yeah. That's that's one of our protocols. Yeah. I learned that the hard way. We're not going to talk a whole lot about it. It's, you just got the spotlight put on you, that right? You just got some spotlight. <laughs> it, was, that's it, was, all it, is. it was a lot of spotlight put on on me that morning when everybody realized that I didn't have images of the full full spine. Watch but, uh, after today, after people listen to this, the, the term pimped is going to be no longer. Everybody's going to say they got the spotlight put on them. That's it. Yeah, man. It's your time to shine. Let it happen. Yeah, yeah let's get into today's talk, though, guys. This is what we're all here for. Uh, Dr. Fitz, why don't you go ahead and introduce what we're talking about today and our guest. Absolutely. We have a great one in store for you today. We have Dr. Hogan. Uh, he's coming in to talk about Liz Frank injuries. And actually, let's let's be more correct. It's Liz Frank. Liz Frank injuries. <laughs> I actually think it has like a French or something, a connection back there. Uh, everybody knows the story, I'm sure, about this guy was actually a gynecologist, right? Yeah. And if you don't, you can look it up. But that's 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 neither here nor there. But anyway, we have Dr. Hogan coming in talking about Liz Frank injuries. Uh, Dr. Hogan did his residency at the University of Virginia. Uh, he did his fellowship at the Hospital of Special Surgery, uh, fellowship in foot and ankle, of course. Uh, and like I say, this is actually a topic I remember as a med student. I saw this x-ray one day, and I said to myself, yeah, that's broke. So yeah. <laughs> if, if if back then if I could see that it was broken, it must be really must be pretty bad off. That's still pretty much my main diagnosis to this day. Like, oh yeah, that's that's pretty jacked up. Mm -hmm. And that this is one of those type cases where you can see a whole lot of that. I hope you all enjoy the talk. I think it's gonna be a great one. I'm really looking forward to it and I hope you are too. Yep, it's gonna be great. And and Doctor Hogan is also the uh program director for the Pittsburgh residency program. So in case any of you guys are thinking about going to UPIT, you know, he might be a good person to uh, to speak to. Wink, wink. Nailed it, gave you the plug. 
Guys, enjoy the episode, guys. You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast featuring doctors Jay Fitz and Wendell Cole. Dr. Hogan, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. It's, uh, it's great to have you. Uh, great to be here. Um, I'm looking forward to our to our talk today on uh, Liz Frank injuries and you know and you know getting into some foot and foot and ankle stuff. Um, but you know, pleasure to have you, uh, me and uh, Dr. Fitz here. And uh, we kind of just wanted to start off just asking some questions, just kind of getting to know you first. Uh, and the one question that we want to ask. That uh, that is, that I guess it's almost a stereotypical question. Is why did you actually choose to go into the field of orthopedic surgery? Well, uh, great question. Um, for me, um, you know, like many orthopedic surgeons, I, I sustained a pretty bad injury when I was in high school. Uh, as a senior, uh, I was a senior high school football player, uh, and uh, one of the games I was participating in, I sustained an ankle fracture dislocation. Uh, it was pretty bad. Prior to that time, I was always interested in medicine, uh, and the orthopedic surgeon who reduced my ankle on the field that night uh, knew I had a pre-med interest and told me I should think about orthopedics. Uh, growing up in Alabama, he essentially told me that he loved what he did, uh, and he gets to watch football games on Friday and call it work. And so to me, I was sold. And so <laughs> that was my, that was uh, my first exposure. Uh, but then, just going through medical school, it always it continued to interest me, regardless of the different fields that. Uh, uh, I looked into and, and uh, worked with them, and uh, it, it gave me a passion and enjoy going to work each day. And so that's that, that's still the scenario to this day. Yeah, that's great that you found something that you love and you're passionate about. Um, I, I love that, and I, you know, stereotypical ortho injury. Um, so the second question we want to ask is, you know, as an attending now, is there anything that you would tell yourself as an intern if you could? It's great. It's a great question. Um, you know, be be a sponge. Be approachable uh, if you do those things and take and then attack life every day as things could always be worse or the glass half full, then, I mean, you know, the world is all, your, is all yours. I mean, it's just a great field to be in. And as an intern, I would just try to suck up as much knowledge and exposure and experience as humanly possible um, while striking a balance with life. Uh, if you have that balance, then, you know, it makes it that much easier for you to absorb all the good things that come your way. So that, that would be my advice. All right. So, and actually, I, I have a question for you as well, Dr. Hogan, but this is something that I, I just realized. I think I knew this at one time, but I kind of forgot. You're from Alabama, right? Yep, I'm from Alabama. I grew up in a place called Muscle Shoals. Oh, Muscle Shoals. Okay, I see. Okay. Got the Alabama so, guys here. Yeah, you know, that, that, that rings home. So I'm from <laughs> Birmingham myself, Birmingham, Alabama, and I'm familiar with Muscle Shoals as well. All right, so good deal. Two Bama boys on, on, the, on, the, on the top today. Good deal. That makes yeah, I love it. <laughs> uh, so my question is uh, kind of outside of orthopedics. I was going to ask, what's like one of your favorite hobbies outside of medicine? Outside of medicine, um, I love golf. Um, you know, I've been, uh, I started playing when I was a medical student, and um, I, I really enjoyed stress relief that comes with it. I mean, that, that's the leisure activity. And then also I, I, I love spending time with my family. I mean, uh, my wife and I have two small, uh, two young daughters, uh, Monica and Kiana, who are five and two. So when I have uh, spare time and leisure time, I like to spend as much of it as I can with them. Okay. That sounds, that sounds great. Uh, actually golf is one of the things that I wish that I could do now, but uh, as a resident is, as don't seem like I'm gonna have, the time. <laughs> yeah. Especially as an intern, don't look like I'm gonna have the time to get into it just yet. But it's on my one, it's on my to do list. Let's get into this great talk. So I'm gonna mention the case here just briefly. Uh, so the case would be a 34 year old female who fell off. Uh, let's say fell eight foot off, eight feet off of a roof, and now she comes into the ED tonight. Uh, she's complaining of mid foot pain. Uh, you notice some swelling around the dorsum of the foot, and you also notice some uh, bruising at the on the plantar surface of, his, of of her foot. Okay, so that's just generally what the the case will look like in this particular instance. And of course, we want to get into uh, some of the history and physical exam that you will get into. Uh, but before we get into that, 
I would like to see if we could just talk about the actual anatomy of the Liz Frank uh, joint. So the anatomy of the foot and the midfoot, um, it's a unique, a, a unique anatomy. Um, it, it's essentially what makes man his own. And so understanding the midfoot articulations that occur between um, the metatarsals, the first through fifth metatarsal basis, and the cuneiforms and the cuboid, and essentially the tarsal metatarsal joints, uh, is very important. So the second metatarsal, which is uh, the longest metatarsal uh, in most feet and has a more proximally driven uh, extension, which establishes the keystone of the foot, um, is it, critical to midfoot stability. Uh, and then as you work your way across the foot from the medial column uh, of the foot with the first tarsal metatarsal joint all the way through to the, which is the medial side being a little more of the stable, aspect of the midfoot working all the way to the lateral fourth and fifth tarsal metatarsal basis uh, is more mobile. Now, when we talk about the Liz Frank complex, we're really focused on uh, that junction of the first tarsal metatarsal really through the third tarsal metatarsal joints and the Liz Frank ligament being uh, an interosseous ligament that goes along the plantar surface from the medial cuneiform to the base of the second. There's a dorsal and plantar uh, component, uh, as I like to explain in my residence, and patients, you know, P is for power, and plantar ligaments uh, are uh, the strongest ones uh, uh, of that complex. That was so good right there. P is for power. Yeah, I never <laughs> thought of that. Me out a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> that helped me out a whole lot just that quick. Uh, and that, that's great. That's a that's a great start, I think. Can we also just kind of mention uh, the columns of the, of the midfoot as well? Yeah, so the foot, uh, we talk about the medial column. The middle column yeah. and the lateral column. The medial column is really the first tarsal metatarsal joint, as well as the navicular cuneiform articulation. Um, and the middle column is made up uh, of the second and third tarsal metatarsal joints and the articulations that they have uh, with a uh, component of the navicular, as well as the mi- uh, middle and lateral cuneiforms. The lateral column of the foot is the four, represents the fourth and fifth tarsal metatarsal joints. And those are the most mobile aspects of the tarsal metatarsal joint complex. And those joints, uh, their mobility is what allows the foot to accommodate to the floor when we're standing. And, and that's why you want flexibility in those joints. Sure. So, so it's like when we're reviewing, like if we kind of recap about it. So we go back, our first TMT joint is mobile, second and third stable. And then we get back to the fourth and fifth TMT joints again, we're, we're getting into a little bit more mobility. Exactly. So the fourth and fifth tarsal metatarsal joints are more mobile than the first. Uh, the first is more, and the first is more mo- more mobile than the second and third. But the mobility within the first tarsal metatarsal joint is one of those. It's one of those joints that's quite variable for us in our understanding in orthopedics, uh, in that some individuals have a more hypermobile uh, first tarsal metatarsal joint, uh, but the second and third uh, really should be very stable. Uh, and uh, when you have a Liz Frank injury. Uh, instability of that complex uh, is really what drives uh, midfoot collapse and then further uh, morbidity, uh, if not managed. Perfect, perfect, perfect. I think that was a great, uh, a great explanation of the anatomy of the list, Frank. So that you know, if people now we're kind of oriented to what we're looking at. So if we kind of go back to our case, you know, we had this 30, 34 year old female fell eight all eight feet. Uh, she has this midfoot pain, swelling, ecchymosis. What are some of the pertinent things that we want to look for on a, you know, a history and physical exam findings? Like, what is going through your mind? So when the person with this history presents, you want to be thinking about the neurovascular exam. The, the most important things to identify are those things that could cause the most long-term morbidity initially. And so nerve injury, which could be a result of the actual trauma itself, um, it could be a representation of a dislocation, uh, a very unstable foot, uh, and also, uh, as the nerves and arteries run together, the vascular exam, you want to have an understanding of uh, their pulses, perfusion to the foot. Uh, and uh, if someone has nerve injury or altered sensation in combination with a vascular injury, that's a foot that is at risk. Um, but uh, And also, particularly, if, if they are having early paresthesias or lots of uh, numbness along the foot, you want to be concerned about um, you know, one of the few emergencies in orthopedics, which is compartment syndrome. Uh, but those are the physical exam things you really want to focus on initially. From there, uh, taking their swelling 
where the swelling is located, the ability uh, for them to actually uh, move their toes, motor function of the foot. Uh, and uh, what some, as you mentioned earlier, this person has a plantar ecchymosis sign, which is uh, can be a pathogen pneumonic for an individual that has injured the plantar ligaments of their list frank, list frank complex, particularly when it's located at the midfoot. Uh, and they can, some, they can give you a degree of the injury that you may be dealing with. Right. Now, are there typical uh, types of injuries that you kind of see Liz Frank uh, injuries like more common in, like the mechanism of the injury? So the Liz Frank, repeat, essentially replicating the Liz Frank injury mechanism is, is also one of constant debate and under a lot of research interest. Uh, but we know falls from heights uh, can contribute to this, particularly with a plantar flex foot. Um, the uh, MTP joints uh, can be hyperextended, but a plantar flex foot with a rotational component being mostly external rotation with a axial load uh, at uh, transmitting through the tarsal metatarsal joints um, is one mechanism that we know very commonly uh, can lead to a Liz Frank uh, injury, whether that be a spectrum, uh, spectrum of disease or injury being a sprain all the way through a, a complete dislocation. Uh, so that's one of the most common mechanisms. Okay, absolutely. And, um, yeah, and I know there's some literature out there that also supports, you know, you also see it sometimes in your athletes. Sometimes they come in and uh, just uh, some, some. this is one of the, I guess, ligamentous injuries that they can sometimes get from some just basic uh, sports injuries as well. So that's something to look out for, I think, also. So uh, one has to have a very high, uh, you know, as I like to say, a spidey sense of looking for this. Uh, and a uh, high rate of suspicion, uh, and uh, often in those subtle injuries, when someone says they sprained their foot but they couldn't walk on it after, uh, you should always be concerned that it's more severe than just a simple sprain, and, and that and a Liz Frank injury should always be in that differential. <laughs> Absolutely. It's something I try to keep in mind all the time when I have, uh, you know, a patient come in and they have this foot pain, all of a sudden they can't walk, and, you know, you look on the x-ray and there's nothing that you see a whole right. lot just yet, but it's something to keep in mind, especially if they kind of have like that midfoot pain or uh, something like that. I think it's very key to keep this in, in mind so you don't forget it. But that's actually going to kind of help me move on to my next the next section here. So, you know, say I'm the resident who who's seeing this patient comes in. I'm, uh, you know, from the physical exam and the history, I'm thinking there's definitely something going on with the foot. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and order some imaging for it as well. And uh, most hospital systems, I think they do really well. So you, you put in, you know, foot x-ray, and first thing that comes up is, uh, you know, three view, AP, oblique, and lateral. Okay. All right. So they got me that far. Now, once I order that, and these films come back in, what, what am I really looking for uh, for this type of injury pattern? Well, uh First, I mean you're absolutely right. You're you want to they're going to give you an AP oblique lateral. Um, often, particularly in the emergency room setting, and particularly in an acute setting when someone has too much pain, these are going to be non weight bearing images. Uh, weight bearing imaging is, is preferred, but again, when it's not possible, you, know, you have to you know know what you're looking for. On an AP, you really want to look at the articulation of the first tarsal nerve tarsal joints and the second tar tarsal nerve tarsal joints, uh, and how they align with uh, the cuneiforms. And so uh, the lateral border of the first tarsal, meta tarsal joint or the first metatarsal base should really align with the medial cuneiform. But more importantly, the medial border of the base of the second metatarsal should line, be in alignment uh, with uh, the most medial border uh, of the middle cuneiform. Uh, now, that's one of the first signs mm -hmm. of stability but if you have gapping there, which we'll talk about, uh, you should be concerned. Uh, also, if you have too much space between the medial cuneiform and the middle cuneiform. Uh, and then uh, the flex sign, which is a sign that has really stood the test of time from a research standpoint and study standpoint, is when you have a component or an avulsion of bone off of the base of the second metatarsal, where that Liz Frank ligament has essentially pulled off a component of the bone during the injury. You also going to have a fleck of bone that's pulled off of the medial cuneiform at that junction as well. Uh, so those are the things you want to look for on the AP. When you go to an oblique film, uh, you really are looking at the third, fourth, and fifth metatarsal um, 
articulations and how they align with their respective tarsal metatarsal joints. Uh, and you want the fourth, the lateral board of the fourth uh, metatarsal to align with uh, the cuboid uh, on imaging. If that aligns appropriately, normally you don't have too much instability there. Uh, but those are the main things you're looking for. On the lateral film, if it's a very severe injury, very high, in- uh, high energy, uh, and you have a complete dislocation, uh, you can sometimes appreciate dorsal subluxation uh, of either the second tarsal metatarsal joint or second metatarsal or even dorsal subluxation of the first uh, metatarsal base in relation uh, to the respective cuneiform at, at that at that TMT joint. The la- on the lateral view, when you have uh, high energy injuries, um, you and, and you're able to get weight bearing films, you sometimes can appreciate a dorsal subluxation of the first or second uh, metatarsals in relation to the medial and middle cuneiforms, consistent with uh, instability of the TMT joints. Um, so that's something to look for uh, on the lateral. Okay, absolutely. And I guess um, how often or, you know, what, you know, does it take a lot of thought before you go into getting into a CT for these type of injuries? So in the setting of the acute presentation and high energy trauma, such as this case, the fall from heights of a 34-year-old woman, Getting a CT scan to further delineate where the fracture lines may exist um, and instability of the joint um, uh, overall uh, is something worth doing and can be very helpful, particularly for uh, operative planning and just patient education and decision making. Uh, in the case of uh, appropriate alignment on x ray uh, and um, a case where you may or not be considering, where you may not be considering operative intervention. Um, you can really um, either hold off on the CT or if there's considerable uh, swelling and you really can't put in the x-rays is relatively normal, uh, the CT scan can give you uh, some additional info. Uh, and also in the case of some of frank injuries where all the plane films are normal, but they're still just having the uh, discomfort pain and you're trying to determine the grade of the ligamentous injury, uh, MRI can also be uh, potentially helpful. Okay. Okay. And, and are there any classification systems that are that are uh, widely accepted or, or used for list frank injuries? So a lot of the classification, there are classification systems that exist. Um, one was uh, described by Myerson several decades ago and really talked about the pattern of injury uh, or subluxation or dislocation that's occurring uh, at the TMT joints. And, and it's really based off the column concept of divergence between the medial and middle columns versus the middle and lateral columns, uh, and in some cases, um, uh, complete uh, abduction of the forefoot at the level of the tarsal metatarsal joint. Um, interestingly enough, uh, none of these classification systems are really tied in directly with outcome and predicting outcome, but, but right. are helpful to understand and be aware of. Okay, perfect. Uh, now, so say, you know, we have this patient, she came in, you know, she has those clinical signs, we got x-ray films, and we found out she has a Liz Frank injury. How, what are the treatment options? Like, how, what are the non-operative indications, first of all, and then how would we treat it non-operatively? And then we can get into kind of, you know, the operative indications and, and what we would choose. Oh, no, great question. So in a scenario where someone has um, a uh, Liz Frank sprain or an injury that is not... Uh, present with significant displacement across the Liz Frank complex and tarsal metatarsal joint, um, particularly if they have less than two millimeters of uh, shift or displacement in comparison to the contralateral uh, and uninjured side, one can consider non obvious management. Uh, and, and in many of those cases, uh, we place the individual into a cam boot or a walking boot of some type, make them non-weight bearing. You also have the option of cast uh, immobilization, a short leg cast uh, with uh, non-weight bearing uh, for two to three weeks. At which point in time, in those cases, I bring those individuals back to my office. Their swelling has improved. I then attempt to do a weight bearing x-ray and image uh, to determine if there's additional diastasis. Uh, and in individuals who are unable to do that uh, or where there is specifically displacement, um, then I would consider those individuals for surgery. 
Perfect, perfect. And and so since you mentioned surgery, what are the operative uh, indications, you know, proceed with an operative treatment? And then from there, how do we decide whether we go? You know, the big thing is arthrodesis versus fixation. And then, you know, even some cases I, I've, I've read about closed reduction with percutaneous pinning. So when would we, uh, like, how would we pick uh, the treatment, uh, the, the operative treatment? And then, you know, what are the, some of the operative indications? Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, when, when surgical intervention is likely required, uh, cases of frank dislocation, open fractures, fractures where there may be soft tissue compromised due to the, due to the displacement present, many of those need to be uh, repaired surgically. Uh, that, that's the main that's the main indication, definite indication. Um, uh, the question in regards to whether you should perform an open reduction in terms of fixation versus closed reduction in percutaneous pinning uh, versus arthrodesis of primary fusion is one of continuing debate. Um, I think many would agree uh, in a skeletally mature individual who has a pretty high energy trauma uh, with uh, fracture or significant dislocation of the tarsal joint or the lift frame complex, uh, a primary arthrodesis uh, has borne out of the studies uh, to be the best procedure uh, for the reasons I, I, I will uh, state now. One, uh, it's been most reliable in pain relief long-term uh, and studies have been published. Two, uh, the least likelihood uh, to require a subsequent procedure and removal of hardware. Uh, and uh, three, it's one of the most reliable procedures to get people back to their activity after their period of mobilization. Um, that said, uh, over reduction of tunnel fixation, and close, uh, particularly uh, ORF, uh, is still a great uh, approach for these procedures, and one that I use on a patient-specific basis. Um, really, regardless of age, uh, if they're less than 50, I really speak with the patient, their activity level, uh, and expectation. Um, uh, and if they are not very high energy, uh, and there's not a lot of articular involvement uh, to the injury, um, I will consider in those particular cases uh, to do a uh, open reduction of internal fixation uh, with subsequent removal of hardware in the future. Um, the, it's important to just note that most of the studies looking at um, treatment of Liz Frank injuries uh, with arthrodesis primarily, we're really speaking to the uh, ligamentous injuries um, that uh, carried with them significant subchondral plate uh, and uh, cartilaginous surface injury, uh, which usually occurs uh, in very high injury trauma. So uh, those are the options. I, I personally do not do a lot of closed reduction and percutaneous pinning of the first, second, and third TNT joints. I will use temporary K-wire fixation across the lateral column of the foot uh, for stability, and I'll remove those in six weeks. Uh, but there are some studies out there, uh, particularly in South America, Europe, and some here in the, uh, in the U.S. Uh, where closed reduction and percutaneous pinning is performed, uh, and it is definitely a great option to have in the setting of soft tissue compromise uh, and a desire not to use a definitive internal uh, fixation um, uh, due to wound healing or infection concerns. Yeah. Now, now I did have a question. So, so say that this was an acute versus a versus like a. Uh, a chronic injury, right? So for, say we had this patient, they just came in now versus this injury just occurred, it occurred six months ago, you know, they've been walking on it and you know now they come into the office. Does your treatment, you know, I guess algorithm or plan change on whether you'd go with the arthrodesis versus uh, fixation? Yes. Uh, in my particular practice, the individual who presents with the subacute or chronic Ms. Frank injury, let's say four to six weeks, uh, six weeks or more out from injury, uh, that is an individual based on an uh, imaging uh, position of their foot that I will uh, more strongly consider a primary orthodesis um, for treatment of that injury uh, and have a discussion with the patient. Um, and if it is, uh, and that's why these injuries being picked up while in the emergency room are it's so important. I mean, 20 to 30 percent of Liz Frank injuries are still missed in emergency departments despite uh, efforts to increase awareness of these injuries. And so those are the individuals who present with what you just described. Uh, several months following the end, right. chronic pain, uh, arch collapse, 
with the formula that is developing at the Tarsal Metal Tarsal Joint, those individuals almost always are best served with a arthrodesis or fusion type procedure. Right. And and, and I, again, I remember I was looking, I was actually doing some questions on on, on this topic, and, and they were kind of mentioning and saying that the outcomes for arthrodesis versus ORIF, again, are, are very, um, yeah, not, I guess kind of like all over the place, like there's different studies saying, you know, arthrodesis versus ORIF. So as far as you know, there's still no uh, no preference or no, no validated or no uh, concentrically agreed upon uh, outcome uh, versus, you know, our outcome for arthrodesis versus ORIF? No, they're not. And so the it really is up to surgeon preference and patient expectation, and it should be a shared decision. That said, um, the, the, the the one randomized you know, level one study that was published in JJS by Coetzee and his group um, years ago looked at primary arthrodesis versus O production term fixation for ligamentous injuries. And that is the study that found uh, what I mentioned uh, earlier that uh, decreased pain with, arth- with arthrodesis and a decreased likelihood for, uh, a, for hardware to be removed in the future. And so from there, uh, the use of primary arthrodesis became uh, more common spread and more uh, of a academic debate. Uh, but uh, I think the most important thing is that you provide the patient a stable foot, um, a plantar grade foot, uh, that they can uh, go through a full weight-bearing stride through uh, with stability across the TMT joint. Um, it's, it's common, particularly when, when testing on this topic. It's very rare unless you have that scenario I just mentioned. You know, ligament injury, um, high energy, where they would give you the option of arthrodesis and open reduction of terminal fixation. It's just very rare because it's so controversial. But if you get that exact scenario, uh, I would pick arthrodesis because it's likely uh, they're likely referencing that uh, that level one study, which uh, level one studies are obviously quite rare uh, in the realm of orthopedics. Absolutely, I was just about to ask about that, and uh, you just cleared it, so good deal. Um, that was one of the articles. That I asked what was specifically? Uh, the one he was mentioning about uh, like primary uh, ligamentous Liz Frank joint injuries and kind of the arthrodesis yeah. versus the open uh, reduction internal fixation. So perfect. Uh, yeah, like you say, I think uh, that article kind of was leaning towards primary arthrodesis for those. But um, all right. On to the next. Uh, for the ones that you do, the ORIF, and I know this is, probably very surgeon dependent and, and preference dependent. Um, but is there any particular approach that you like to, to go with, uh, with fixing this type of injury? For me, um, I like to use a, you know, a, taking, making a decision over the first web space, uh, particularly at the base of the first, at the first, the base of the first and second part of the tarsal joint. Uh, this allows me to clear the Liz Frank uh, complex, uh, if there's any debris, fracture fragment. Uh, uh, tissue there. Uh, I can also assess uh, tarsal metatarsal joint stability between the first and second tarsal metatarsal joint. If there's instability appreciated there, particularly dorsal subluxation, I would then perform a bridge plate fixation um, across uh, the unstable joints. Sometimes that's just the first. Uh, sometimes you have the first and second. Uh, and uh, then I will go and uh, immediately and make an incision uh, immediately and expose over the medial cuneiform, uh, I will expose down to the level of the uh, tibialis anterior insertion, uh, and I will place, uh, making sure not to damage the uh, uh, tibialis anterior, I would then place a screw across the Liz Frank complex from the medial cuneiform into the base of the second uh, metatarsal. Uh, and in the setting of intercuneiform instability, I will also place a screw from the medial cuneiform uh, into the lateral cuneiform. This is obviously all being done in the setting of open reduction and total fixation. If I'm moving forward with primary arthrodesis, uh, I will um, likely perform a two incision dorsal technique uh, so that I can place screw or plate fixation um, uh, or, any, or even possible uh, compression staple fixation across the first, second, uh, and if required, third tarsal metal tarsal joint uh, uh, to achieve a successful fusion. Okay, that's that's perfect. I was just kind of curious to see kind of which route you do with that. I I know I'm just kind of looking through some of the literature. I know I saw a couple of different types, uh, like some they have like this dual incision type thing. But yeah, I know there's 
probably a handful of uh, approaches to actually go with. So I actually appreciate you going over yours that you prefer. Uh, I think that helped me out a whole lot. But just before we finish, I always think it's important to kind of know what to look for when we have this patient back in our clinic. Um, so what kind of complications do you have to con- kind of uh, consider uh, as far as long-term with this patient? So uh, first thing you want to be concerned about, particularly while you still have open, uh, fresh wounds or infection, um, uh, uh, foot and ankle uh, environment or risk of infection or even superficial wound complications is as high as uh, 20 to 30% just due to the nature of the environment that we're operating on. Also, mm-hmm. due to the soft tissue trauma, the amount of swelling that goes along with these injuries, we always want to be mindful of compartment syndrome uh, or wound complications that occur as a result of uh, increased edema and swelling. Uh, from there, there's, it's not uncommon, uh, or it is common uh, to have uh, some residual uh, sensory changes uh, along the dorsum of the foot uh, and those that, and the toes that are affected uh, from the initial trauma. Um, you can have, uh, in the setting of, if you move forward with primary orthodesis, uh, you can have a non-union rate as high as, 10, as, high as 10 to 15 percent. Uh, so you need to be very technically sound with your fusion. Um, and also the uh, issue with broken hardware, that's why often the hardware needs to be removed anywhere from four to six months post-surgery. Um, and, uh, and when those things occur, you have to be mindful and just really advise the patient prior. Uh, one of the most common long-term complications of wrist range injuries is post-traumatic arthritis and progressive deformity and someone developing arch collapse uh, over the course of their post operative period. And so... Uh, I advise all of these patients that they need to be at a firm, supportive shoe um, with a uh, uh, with an orthotic, uh, semi-rigid uh, at minimum uh, for at least a year following surgery, particularly with high impact and long walking, um, just to help support their arch. Uh, and that that is something that they should be mindful of um, uh, for days and years to come. So I tell all my patients with a list frank injury, your foot may never be the same. Uh, but we would do what I can to give you the same foot as best we can. Uh, and so I think that's important uh, for patient education and monitoring. All right. Well, absolutely. I think this was a, a, a good talk on the list, Frank, injury. Um, and I think it's a good time to wrap it up. But before we go, Dr. Hogan, we always like to give our guests a chance to let our listeners know how to reach back out to them if they wanted to. Is there any um you know, social media or uh, websites that you have that you would like for our listeners to know about? Um, you can find me on orthopit.edu uh, here at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, where I'm on faculty and service program director. Um, I'm always happy to uh, uh, speak with people, help where I can, uh, and be a point of access for patients uh, and uh, learners alike. So don't uh, be afraid to reach out. Absolutely. And uh, just from, uh, I I know I've heard a lot of great things about Dr. Hogan. I know he's a a big help to a lot of the, a lot of the young doctors coming in. Uh, So uh, reach out if you you need to. uh, Before we go, I just want to tell you, thank you again, Dr. Hogan, for taking this time out to to bring this great information to us. And I want to say thank you to all the listeners. Yeah. And y'all have a great day. Now, thank you all for listening to this episode with Dr. Hogan. I hope you all learned a lot about Liz Frank injuries, how to manage them, and kind of some of the approaches. And hopefully the next time this comes into the ED, you all know what to do. Um, Now, if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and please go and rate us in iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever you use to listen to us. Please give us a five-star rating. And follow us at Nailed It Ortho at Instagram, Nailed It Ortho at gmail.com if you have any questions. And you can also follow us online at NailedItOrtho.com.